Um, which is that uh, as many of you who uh, are returning to our webinar series, you know what our structure is. Uh, we usually give the speaker about an hour to speak and after that we have a question and answer session. Uh, we request all uh, participants to type in their questions into the chat box, which we will read out. Uh, the reason is that that makes it easier for the speaker to get more questions and uh, it also allows for a wider participation. So, Professor Tharagat, all yours. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Anima. Um, welcome, um, Shokni Chattopadhyaya. Um, we are very grateful to you for finding time to um, share your views on this subject, which was, um, uh, which is um, a bit of a strange subject as far as uh, my uh, usual uh, readings go. Um, you, have, you have gone at a subject, we have reached a subject which is um, normally not worked on that much, but nevertheless should be an extremely rich source of perspectives, especially on the uh, social structure as well as the evolution of society in uh, colonial and also post-colonial India. Um, state narratives of mortuary work in colonial India. Now, um, the, I, I remember uh, doing a survey in a particular region in the city of Calicut or Kodikod, uh, Northern Kerala, where there was this group of uh, people whose um, um, longevity um, averages do not tally with what you find around. And it was a bit intriguing. And on further inquiry, I realized that there were descendants of uh, people who were, uh, who were my, who were made to migrate from um, Andhra, Andhra, Andhra region. They belong to the, in the caste structure, at the lowest levels of the caste structure. And they were brought to do mortuary work as well as scavenging work. Um, even the combination sounded very, very, uh, very stark and, you know, very, now, uh, their earlier uh, deprivation in which they had to live persisted. And you know, even now, they live only up to a certain age at an average. And that was why the average didn't hold for that region. Um, so I'm sure that you know, your work should be um, drawing up such um, such uh, information as well as perspectives. And we are all uh, happy to uh, hear you on behalf of the KCHR, as well as the our friends who have all uh, arrived here to listen to you. Uh, I welcome you. Sohini uh, Chattopadhyaya. Um, thank you, Professor, for that really warm welcome. I'll quickly share my screen because I thought I'll put some pointers so that it's easier to uh, understand. Um, let me just quickly share this. Yeah, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so before I sort of start talking about this presentation, and particularly because thank you for the generous amount of time that has been allotted, um, I briefly wanted to uh, point out why I came to this topic, so that that also helps us to understand sort of my slightly haywire method in this. Um, 
I was basically at one point of time volunteering to teach English in a school in Calcutta, which also worked as a mortuary charity. Uh, I did not know about it till I saw quite a bit of uh, cops disposal vans outside. And I asked what was going on. And then I got to know that this is um, a society that exists from around 1905. A lot of old, um, uh, renowned politicians from Bengal were part of it, including Fazlul Haq, uh, Khwaja Nazimuddin, and so on. So basically, it was the heart of Bengal politics. And they still continue to assist uh, various medical colleges in procuring unclaimed bodies and giving them a proper funeral, a proper uh, burial. And in a certain way, also sort of in that process, claiming those bodies back into the folds of uh, community. So at that point of time, I realized that this is uh, an interesting archive to think about uh, society and also to think about the technological shifts that come with uh, mortuary work and the shifts that occur with it. And particularly when it comes to who are the people who are working, how are the charities relations with municipality and so on. So that's sort of like a very uh, basic beginning. It was really like a interesting hunt for something new. I learned when I was in my, uh, doing my ME actually in GNU. So um, this uh, today's uh, presentation will be broadly on the brief history of mortuary work in colonial India. Um, it's um, going to look at a few case studies from colonial Bombay and Bengal presidencies, and it produces mostly official documents such as hospital police and municipal reports. Um, in this presentation, I hope to suggest how caste-based work became central to modernizing projects of death management, such as sort of creation of public burial grounds, implementation of incinerators, rules of dissection. And simultaneously, I hope that these documents will also demonstrate, like I have seen, how public health experts who came from uh, privileged caste backgrounds and also who were European, many of them were Europeans, and of course, the rising medical professions displayed certain degrees of discomfort in acknowledging that caste-based work is foundational to practices that are considered modern and scientific. Um, the presentation I hope will also be you know, an, an invitation to think about how official bureaucratic transactions manage the relationship what we, between what we know as scientific practice within you know, restricted areas like uh, graveyards and uh, the dissection table and so on and also the larger social difference that existed and shifted around in colonial India. So I hope with these, we can get a sense of sort of how uh, state narratives sort of manage the practice of science on one hand and also uh, manage the relationship between science and social difference. And of course, given the time that we are in, it's also an invitation to discuss the legacies of the past in our presence. So, I am going to talk very simply about so, uh, very few things, um, particular, uh, particularly because uh, this is not a part of my chapter as such, but these are snippets and uh, from various parts of my dissertation, uh, mostly because all my chapters have components about mortuary work in them. Uh, like I said, the shifts in the colonial period that we see with uh, mortuary work in India includes the reorganization of burial grounds and so on. But for this presentation, I'm going to stick to a few big machines uh, and a few big technologies. Now, what do you mean by that? So by big machines, um, let's go to the next slide. So I am going to look at incinerators, um, transit of bodies through lorries and so on. These are the two big machines I want to look at. And then I'm going to look at uh, sort of big technologies like transformation, such as dissection and the process, the technological transformations that come around with mortality data collection. So um, while we look at these four technological shifts in colonial India, and we'll also look at their enduring practice today. Um, and also uh, at the same time, um, the it's important that, I think it's important that we look at these particular technologies because 
by now, it's pretty unfortunately safe to say that we have all as collective, uh, as a collective have witnessed death in our lives at a frequency, which has somewhat been unprecedented in the lives of the middle class and the privileged caste and class, especially the urban denizens. Because the social contract of healthcare between the state and the privileged caste and class, predominantly again, as I said, the urban citizens of India crumbled for a while and it's just been gradually repaired. Uh, with it, we have been exposed to death and the signs and rituals around it with an unparalleled frequency. So the question then obviously remains that what is this world of death, of death work and death technologies? Um, so in this presentation, based on snippets from various chapters of my dis dissertation, uh, I do not really intend to uh, retrieve voices of mortuary workers. I don't think the sources permit that, or I don't think that's uh, a plausible thing to do at this point. But I want to think about ways in which the millennial history of caste power running through practices of privilege and the modern history of colonialism and capitalism together interact to create knowledge about mortuary science. In this way, I sort of like my project intervenes in the works of both social anthropology and social history and the history of science by sort of trying to piece them together. Scholars of South, uh, social anthropology made colonial and post-colonial administrations vivid through a focus of the material history and the material practices of death. They include scholars who've worked on the Second World War to scholars who've worked on caste in India. And then there have been others who have studied the slow transformations through the disregard of vernacular rituals in South and then also in South Africa, for example, I draw a lot upon such, such work. And also in India, where we look at uh, transformations of rituals to the practices of caste. Um, simultaneously, this project obviously takes us to works of public health and a lot of histories of public health. And I assume and also global science uh, centered in South Asia, but they do not really engage with how historical transformations and global and in global science and technological practices intersected with the lived realities of social difference. So I'm hoping that through um, sort of like uh, descriptions of uh, technologies, which will open up the issue of um, both intellectual and uh, uh, manual work, and tell us about how these two are enmeshed together, but they are created into hierarchies. We'll get to understand the realities of both social difference and science in the process. So uh, uh, my sources are predominantly this. I've used a little bit of India office record, the East India Company Medical Board Proceedings, uh, a few medical college annual reports, uh, especially Bombay, Calcutta, a little bit of uh, medical college in Lahore's report. Municipal reports I've used quite extensively for Bombay and Calcutta, and the report of a few private charities, uh, which are a little sparse. So I've sort of tried to do oral histories in these places to get a better sense of everything. We first let's like, I would like first um, like to talk about dissection, uh, which I think is one of the earliest technologies of death, which functions not just on recreating and understanding what is a body that can be dissected and avoid the unclaimed body. So it was a time that was being defined, but at the same time, who are the ones who uh, touch these bodies and who are the ones whose touch of these bodies are acknowledged as the scientific truth. So let's take this quote in 19, this uh, I found in the medical uh, board proceedings in 1853. Um, this is, after uh, Britain had an anatomy law in 1832, which had categorically pointed out what sort of bodies can be dissected and who were the ones who were going to be responsible and in charge of uh, dead bodies that are going to be dissected. Uh, and Britain had set up an anatomical uh, regulation board, for instance. In India, we didn't have anything as such. Uh, instead, what we have is um, this 1853 declaration after there was a pro protest in the medical college uh, in front of Agra, that unclaimed bodies were being brought in by so-called polluted labor to quote the source. So in 1853, the governor general in council uh, announced that uh, the uh, company state does not consider a formal measure to be necessary 
to deliver anatomical for those who are delivering anatomical lectures and instead the bodies of unclaimed and unknown persons who are dying in prisons or under the charge of government such as asylums and in case of calcutta the police hospital in case of bombay a few hospitals uh, which were coming in place uh these bodies can come to the go, go to the dissection table but here is one small snippet that uh, got my attention which is which says care being taken that it is done quietly and without attracting undue attention in another source uh, at, at the similar time uh, the uh, governor general in council again declares very categorically that uh, the so called resurrection men are bringing in bodies to the uh, dissection table and this sort of unholy alliance to quote again should not be entertained and therefore this has to be done quietly and again without un without attracting undue attention like it said here now who are the resurrection men uh the resurrection men is uh, is like again a term that has long lineage in britain it basically mean, meant grave diggers and the resurrection men was again a term that the governor general and council so to say had employed to talk about ex untouchable workers who were going to be the main people who are collecting and procuring bodies so that the signs of dissection could come into being now workers such as such mock mortuary workers brought bodies from cremation and burial grounds it says but we don't really know exactly whether that how much of that is true uh but it is uh, there are enough documents to suggest that the transportation of bodies were predominantly from hospital mobs and um people who died in the hospitals and then transferred to the medical colleges and in the dissection facilities um the uh, these workers they also um, demonstrated the dissections and took part and also took the parts that were dissected for the disposal but then while the high knowledge of science was controlled by as we know uh, the declarative statements that dissection that india becomes sort of modern the moment an upper caste man touches a dead body we know that the actual work of cleaning the body bringing them bringing them to the table and even demonstrating dissections to students were categorized and grouped to people who were then put into the manuals of uh, these medical colleges and written as mortuary assistants servants menials these were the terms or in the case of bengal simply the caste name dome that gradually became synonymous with mortuary work so therefore through dissection the science of dissection medical colleges then become and a site of experiments with caste but at the same time like the statement uh, on the slide as you see the statement constantly suggests that it is done quietly and without undue undue attention if you look at practices of anatomy and if you look at sort of the uh, what are these the examination reports of these medical colleges it is really celebrated when uh, men and then gradually even to a few women would dissect the dead body and these are mostly as we know upper caste uh, men and women nowhere in these examinations do we get examples of workers coming in but if you look at the payrolls of the medical colleges you understand that uh, workers were employed so for example in 1855 the calcutta medical college employed to go four domes to bring cadavers to the hospitals and also to dispose of these body parts they were given hand pulled carts for this purpose and they could dispose of the dissected parts only at night and in complete secrecy uh this is not a time when formaldehyde was used uh, so the dead bodies were not really um the pres they were not really preserved too well so because for dissection formaldehyde came in a little later uh like as we know now formalin is very common and that sort of preserves the body for a long time in 1855 that was the case so we are also dealing with a group of people who are working with uh, highly decomposed bodies which are also dissected and they have to dispose them eventually um what about uh, the doctors um we can look at this uh, quote for example so who were the people who were actually acknowledged as the ones who dissected this is the ent um, this is the entrance exam so to say of the calcutta medical college where we see that a certain form of um, high knowledge is being constructed around them which says all candidates will be expected to possess a thorough knowledge of english who has to be able to read write and enunciate in fluency and facility 
they must be able to analyze a passage in Milton's Paradise Lost, Robertson's histories, or works of a similar classical standard. So while dissection was being extolled as a classical project almost, uh, a project that is going to be an absolute term of modernity and going to be unleashed onto the world and educate uh, the Bengali Bhadraloks into Macaulay's uh, uh, modern man, this um, the task of bringing in the bodies were actually um, unacknowledged, but we get to know about them through payrolls. Um, so uh, we do get a few rare narratives about uh, people who used to work at this uh, mortuary uh, in uh, the dissection tables. For example, in this one novel, uh, sorry, uh, the autobiography of a Bengali novelist, uh, Balai Chan Bandupadhyay, he writes, uh, he was a medical student at the Calcutta Medical College, and he writes about one person whom he addresses as Munna Dom. And we get to know about uh, snippets of information about people who worked uh, through the perceptions of uh, the medical student at that point of time. So to quote Balai Chan, he wrote that uh, Munna Dom would help me a lot. He lived in the balcony outside the dissection room, which we must note. He was always present when one calls, one calls for him, even at night. So this gives us a sense of sort of the uh, dissection room and the medical college as a space of experiments on caste. Again, if we see the medical college as a laboratory space, um, then we see that it has certain interesting radical potentials as to the fact that these are prime property land. And these are places where uh, people who are otherwise going to be shunned out from uh, the society are brought, wi brought within the folds of the perimeter. Is that a radical move? Of course not, because it's the same pra practices of exclusion that is happening spatially in these territories. For example, Mona Dome is living right next to where the site of death is, uh, which is the site of, which is the dissection room. He's always present and which makes sense that there are dome portals in these medical colleges because death isn't a nine to five activity where you know working the working class can commute. It has to be, um, it's a 24 hour job. So uh, these are some of, again, some of the architectural ways through which we can understand mortuary work. But again, they are not really acknowledged in narratives of uh, annual college, annual reports and so on. The next, um, I'll move from sort of like this stuffy realm of medical college to sort of get into the domain of uh, mortality statistics. And this again is sort of a big advancements of a big technology for me, uh, as I understand, because again, it is projecting the modernist impulse of a state in collecting and presenting data in a particular bureaucratic form. But at the same time, it is incorporating work and uh, work, uh, mortuary work in certain ways that remain scantily written about. So, um, and again, what are, uh, here we come to an interesting point, which is very crucial to how we are perce perceiving mortuary work at this point of time in our current domain of pandemic. Now, when it comes to mortality statistics, I uh, found some of the earliest references in municipal documents in 1802 and 1803 one in Bombay, another in Calcutta, which points out that people who work at mortuary grounds, uh, both in native and Christian court quarters, so to say, and also of course the cantonments, uh, they are the ones who are going to be the first person of contact who's going to report whether there has been a new death due to fever or cholera. So these are ways to measure uh, tropical diseases, a, a, a terminology that is also becoming current at that point of time. Uh, but the role of mortuary workers actually come into prominence in reports at moments of mass death. So for example, um, this is a quote that I have from the 1870s, uh, 1880 Famine Commission report, which predominantly focused on you know, uh, the large famine that occurred in Madras and Bombay presidency. And at that point of time, um, many, um, uh, many members of the Famine Commission and also a lot of bureaucrats, a lot of people, uh, journalists also who had uh, who were visiting India uh, from Britain, um, such as you know the famous names like William Digby and so on, they were writing about starvation as a very evident cause of death. 
And these um, famine commission reports, both 1880, 1896, and 1901, picked those up. And uh, the, the, what is the cause of death became a recurrent issue, very much like how we are really confronting uh, the causes of death at this point of time, whether a death is of COVID or not, and so on. So um, the debates were around how to recognize starvation. And most of the famine commissioners acknowledged that we cannot really recognize starvation as a cause of death. That's not, uh, and there were, of course, uh, issues of political economy involved in not acknowledging that due to starvation. Death was instead being acknowledged as uh, caused by cholera, caused by fever, symptoms that can, uh, sym symptomatic of uh, other in, uh, social political reasons of death such as uh, starvation. Um, and one of the reasons that was given as to why starvation death cannot be calculated as such was that the village constables, and in some other reports, it talks about mortuary workers, it talks about the word chokidar, how these people, the, the first line of information collectors, are apparently incapable of the correct diagnosis of death. And this again tells us about a little bit more about how mortuary work was treated within the realm of these bureaucratic documents. Um, then, for example, the 1898 Famine Commission report talks about the same thing, it again, I'll quote, the report suggested that it would be difficult for informers such as sweepers to distinguish between death due to starvation and death due to diseases. But at the same time, it is this massive moment of mass death due to famines, but more importantly, by now, the plague has hit Bombay and has spread across, that in this moment of pandemic and moment of a massive epidemic, that the colonial state even slightly begins to acknowledge the roles or roles of mortuary workers. So many medical officers in 1896, for example, started to uh, write about um, the fact that, okay, maybe there are reasons to acknowledge, uh, maybe we need, maybe the colonial state really needs to train people to identify diseases, because otherwise, unless the mortuary workers themselves, the first line of contacts are trained, it is difficult to understand whether a death has been due to plague or not. Uh, in, um, at the same time, the Famine Commission of 1890, uh, 1901, sorry, uh, which was a revised uh, report. It again pointed out, also incorporating the problem of plague within it, that people who are dying due to uh, famines and due to plague are often also the mortuary workers because they are coming from backgrounds of disenfranchisement that which is structural. And that acknowledgement for the first time uh, comes up again in a moment of mass crisis. And this I thought is interesting to point out because we are again sort of going through that same cycle and I wonder what will become of it. But at the same time, it's not that this sort of moment of um, mass, uh, a moment of acknowledgement uh, really led to massive transformations, right? Um, for instance, um, in uh, one of the famine, uh, sorry, one of the sanitary commissioners uh, again, at, the, uh, at, at around the same time, said that uh, sure, mortality data, uh, the first line of contact for these are the, to quote again, the domes and the sweepers. Um, but at the same time, we need to uh, really uh, take into consideration that these mortuary workers are, to quote, always inebriated. The, this is the custom in place, and this is the, not the matter of true science. And um, so this again tells us that despite the fact that in moments of mass death, um, there was an acknowledgement about who to, who's a frontline worker, there was a constant disavowal in terms of the fact that the front, the first line of information about numbers of death is also again deeply stigmatized and criminalized. And these moments of crisis which bring them to the forefront do not necessarily bring about a revolution of perception. The uh, next, um, I'll just go quickly on this. The next one that I wanted to talk about are the technologies of incineration. And um, this, again, I want to bring this up because the discussion of incineration in uh, colonial India came up as a big topic because firstly, because of cholera, and then gradually it became a 
matter of massive debate due to the bubonic plague epidemic. In fact, some of the earliest conversations around incinerator that you see in Bombay is from the time of the plague, where it's a constant um, issue about where to sort of dispose of dead bodies. And suddenly uh, there's a realization that perhaps incineration is the right mode of working through it. Of course, in Bombay, it did not quite uh, take into place. Um, but, uh, the municipality could not import incinerators they wanted to. And the debates were mostly around the cost and also about um, uh, the fact that the municipality wanted unclaimed bodies to be uh, disposed of through incinerators. And, and then there was also a debate that uh, again becomes important for the case of mortuary workers. Uh, particularly one in 1913 and then another in 1920, the two moments when the municipality discussed uh, importing incinerators for disposal of uh, for cremation, uh, that both the times uh, the corporation pointed out that these are very expensive machines and the people who are going to work on it may not be able to uh, manage it. And Again, we come to this uh, idea that certain forms of big technologies do not really have to, um, cannot be uh, unleashed onto uh, workers whose uh, credibility as being part of the system is understood to be part of custom. So there is then again the social tension that again brings us to the fact that uh, despite the fact that there are certain forms of technologies that could have, um, uh, done the basic work of compressing the use of spaces and so on. Again, uh, it is assumed like we see in a lot of domestic work and use of technologies even now, that people coming from certain castes cannot handle the technologies and cannot handle the science of it. Um, so that is one of the reasons why the incinerators were not imported amongst other things which we can you know, discuss in the Q and A session. Uh, David Arnold also points up, points us out about incinerators imported for um, waste disposal. It's in his new book. In Calcutta, however, there were there was an incinerator to dispose of of unclaimed bodies, and here we come to playing out that same problematic uh, all over again. So, for example, in municipal budgetary debates, as we see. Uh, most of the complaints that came from all the municipal administrators were about uh, saying that it's really expensive to upkeep these machines because the people who work them don't know how to maintain the machines properly. So there's constantly a complaint about the lack of scientific acumen about mortuary workers. There were some uh, letters to the municipality which was printed in the Calcutta Gazette which highlighted rumors that workers would put more than one body into an incinerator and this would jam the system. These congealed into further rumors during the famine of 1943 in Bengal, effectively demonstrating to us the fear of a social class that solely handled the dead. The municipal corporation in Calcutta received news that dead bodies were lying in piles in cremation grounds and incinerators were being used for mass cremation. Again, a similarity that we hear as rumors even now. A similar complaint would be heard during the riots in Calcutta in 1946 in terms of mass burial and mass cremation, and the blame would often fall onto mortuary workers. Now, there is this, while there is this constant uh, uh, debate around uh, the maintenance and upkeep of these machines, and uh, I could not find any archival source materials which would tell me as to what was it actually required to maintain these machines. So here I'd like just to do a very quick detour um, to sort of cover up that gap. Uh, I was sort of employing what a lot of recent historian science have been doing, which is basically go to the sites of the sciences, the scientific practices, see what happens today and sort of mentally try to extrapolate what would have been done in the past. So if you look at an incinerator whose technologies haven't really transformed much in the last 50 to 60 years, except that from gas, many have shifted to electricity, but still we still have a lot of gas furnaces. Like, you know, in Delhi, it's predominantly gas, whereas in Calcutta and uh, Bombay, it's predominantly uh, electric. So for example, it takes about 55 minutes or more um, to cremate a body. The workers at the cremation grounds, they have to assess the heat according to the weight and size of the body. And this requires, of course, skills of commensuration. 
and the furnace has to be maintained at a certain temperature all the time because the cooling and reheating would eventually lead to a lot of um, wastage and a lot of problems with the body of the uh, incinerator itself. So maintenance often almost means maintaining the heat. So there are other issues such as supply of electricity or supply of gas, which are involved. Now, if at this point of time, I went back to look at sort of the archival sources to look at the supply of gas, for example, for the cremation uh, facility in Calcutta. And it turns out that gas was sporadic. So that while that could have been a reason for the incinerator not being able to uh, run its full force or uh, maintain itself properly, the blame often almost fell on the lack of so-called lack of capacity of the workers to maintain or the lack of scientific acumen. Um, so, um, let me just, I'll just skip a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so at the same time, there were uh, there's this other thing that happened in Calcutta, uh, which is that there were protests against incinerators because incinerators are also the sites where initially um, only in particularly in Calcutta only unclaimed bodies were disposed of. So uh, that site of incineration is still the site of where unclaimed bodies of this are disposed of, and also the site where um, a lot of COVID deaths are managed uh, now. So um, in around 1930s, when we see an intense communalization uh, within the municipality and the uh, Bengal government around this time, we also see that um, uh, there's sort of a tendency for Hindu revivalism and so on. And this is like a quote that I'm drawing from uh, Shama Prasad Mukherjee actually, uh, who constantly said that we need to bring in uh, uh, death rituals which are in tandem with uh, the Hindu Shastras. So what uh, Mukherjee and many others who were part of the municipality also said that the what the incinerators do not do is that the work of performing the last rites in incinerators are given to domes. People whose touch, you know, the word, word touch comes in critically, rightly or wrongly is considered as defilement and against the principles of Hindu Shastras prevailing from time immemorial. Let us go back to the idea of you know, uh, millennial practice of caste here. This work has been taken up by the Hindu Satka Samiti, one of the charities I look at, and everybody receives the services of a Brahmin. Uh, what does this actually mean? It means that at this point of time, while uh, uh, we must note this is a time when uh, uh, there is a larger uh, uh, shift in the in, in India about discussions about caste, discussions about community, and at this point of time the stringency is increasing, and uh, a good ritual turns out to be the one where the un where untouchability is removed. Now, if you go through more, more of in details of these reports, uh, these reports are by the way part of the municipality because these commun uh, this particular private charity worked with the municipality. So it's not like the uh, work, uh, mortuary work of uh, relegated to ex untouchables are actually uh, completely removed. It just means that they are made to do those rituals that were existing as in the imagination of the Hindu Shastra as quoted here. Uh, so again, the caste hierarchies are very strongly maintained through uh, these new revivalist movements. Uh, these are some just some uh, I, uh, demonstrations of uh, incinerators as we see today. I wanted to bring these up because again, if you see the layouts, uh, they are uh, uh, they do not point out. Um, this is the entire incinerator, uh, sorry, the entire incineration complex. And these do not have uh, uh, on the maps itself, places or so-called sheds uh, where people who work with the dead, the mortuary workers actually live, even though they mostly like the one, mostly live in the premises. So again, there's a sort of erasure in terms of layout as well, which are part and parcel of today's politics. And I just wanted to bring that out uh, up uh, architecturally. 
we see sort of uh, certain pl places for workers in some of the diagrams, like for example, this uh, diagram put up by the Department of Local Styles Governments, one of the only ones I actually saw where the watchman shed has been uh, put up. And uh, there are other places um, which talk about uh, workers who work within the uh, near the incinerators and so on. But the, it this also has its own politics, of course. Let's skip this one. The final one I really wanted to talk about, and this might come across as an anomaly, is the mass transit system of death. And what do I really mean by that? Uh, it basically means that um, something that is pretty common even now, um, that uh, uh, people, as we know, die in different places, and uh, they have to be transported to uh, facilities of burials and cremations. But um, in uh, moments of mass death, such as what we are facing now, or in moments of mass death, such as famines, or in moments of regular mass deaths, that, which are invisibilized in, our, in today's times, which are unclaimed bodies and unclaimed deaths, which remain in um, hospitals and uh, they are collected after a month or so uh, to be gathered in herds and put in into big vans and taken to incinerators or burial grounds and uh, facilities to dispose them of. So this came up as um, a, a technology from around the 1930s. Of course, this is a technology that is largely related to those two world wars. We have decommissioned lorries, which municipalities in Bombay, Calcutta, uh, Madras um, uh, brought in. They purchased these decommissioned lorries and some of them were used for um, disposing of uh, garbage, while some others were used for uh, disposing of unclaimed bodies and which came into much use during famines and riots and so on. Now, why do I bring this technology here? It's particularly because if you uh, sort of compare within municipality documents, uh, by the way, this is a picture of one of the so-called lorries, if not as big as I would have imagined. Uh, uh, this is the first one in Calcutta that was used. And this is one of the current ones that is used. Um, so uh, we find in both in Calcutta and Bombay municipal records, advertisements sent out for drivers of these vans from the 1930s and 40s. And this is where things become tricky, right? Because we know that uh, driving is was a new skill at that point of time and also partly related to decommissioned soldiers. Um, especially with the maneuvering of big trucks on roads, which were at that point of time, not created wide enough for uh, big trucks. And yet in these cases, it involved death work. So in Calcutta, for instance, the lorry purchase for death disposal lay completely unused for two years, even as other lorries purchased for transportation of uh, goods, including um, uh, 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 products like grains and so on distribution, uh, they found drivers and it the crisis was because this these are mortuary vans so in the end the municipality had to rely on these mortuary charities to lend their volunteers to drive drive these vans and finally when the first person was employed uh, they do come from uh, uh, backgrounds of stigmatized caste because uh, no one else would want to drive these so i wanted to bring in this to highlight how uh, different technologies keep on incorporating the pra millennial practices of caste and uh, how we really need to think of uh, modern science and within that larger dom domain of millennial history. So let us just like, you know, go uh, do a brief recap of what we just uh, spoke about. And uh, what were the sort of keywords when it came to thinking about mortuary work? The key words that I found in a lot of these sources were to the moment people were talking about mortuary work is the word custom or the idea that these are abhorrent practices, but we have to incorporate them or the references to mortuary workers as dangerous people. The terms on payrolls in most of these municipality and medical uh, college reports are servants, menials, keepers, or they go simply by caste names like Mahars and Domes. And in Bombay, gradually, we see the word sweeper being more common than caste names. Uh, in Calcutta, it's still domes, and that's how it's used even now. 
so these are some of the key words that get incorporated within uh, the idea of uh, uh, the scientific practices that incorporate big, big technologies and big machines. Um, uh, it's uh, the word custom legitimized, uh, for example, mortuary workers whose lives are based on stigmatized labor as um, natural workers of disposing of the dead. And they are being mandated by custom and science doesn't really have a place for them, but this is India, one has to deal with it. Uh, and that is another reason why these uh, workers' roles are constantly disavowed. Despite the disavowals and criminalization though, the nexus between medical science and untouchability becomes a new ground to, for many people to demand access to modern institutions and partake in their activities. Something uh, that I came up, uh, I saw in, a, in very few moments, but again, the moment of an epidemic and a pandemic again brings them into fruition. So for instance, um, uh, there are records of mortuary workers strikes during cholera and bubonic plague epidemic. It does not really mean, uh, I'm not saying that there were, no, uh, there were no strikes earlier or after or in any other times. I just mean to say that the state narratives, the plague commission reports and so on, acknowledge these strikes only during epidemics. Um, so for example, in 1897, there were barriers from the, uh, in Jaula district of Bombay Presidency who refused to dig graves without financial protection during the plague epidemic. Bodies rapidly accumulated according to the Plague Commission report as no one else would do the work. Soon the district magistrate had to increase the salaries despite the governmental disavowal as we see of the role of untouchable workers. This is obviously a radical component um, uh, that we see which only gets acknowledged all over again because of uh, well, because of the epidemic. So what do we then learn about these things? Um, first of all, we learn that uh, if the role that millennial practices of caste plays in times of, it's only exposed, the hierarchy is between, um, the, not the hierarchy, but the segregation and the division that is created between sort of like this intellectual work of medical practice and hygiene practice and scientific expertise, versus the relegation of certain positions as unintellectual manual labor is um, it's exposed in times of pandemics and epidemics or in times of establishing a new technological system like when the first time the incinerators were being debated in Bombay. So we are again, let's say, discussing the importance of mortuary work right now as we speak, because we are also within that cyclical system of thinking about death as a crucial uh, visible time for us. So because also death has reached the powerful and the privileged so much. So uh, I will leave with a thought about how we can think about our present in this context, because I think um, it's, it's uh, pertinent that we do. So as a historian, my task is obviously not to predict, but to clarify that the system of disavowal and sudden conversations around death work during mass crisis is built into the scientific practices of death around us. As we saw, it's built into the narratives. It's built into the fact that moment, it's only during moments of crisis or when the new technology is being experimented upon that these um, relationships of labor is brought to the forefront for a brief while. And then it retreats back once systems go back to status quo. So, it's um, then in that sense, you know, the question would be, are, is our collective experience of the pandemic a radical moment to think about death work? Uh, cannot predict, possibly not. But to think otherwise, we have to renegotiate our relationship with science and technological objects and the social relationships that are built around them. So I'll stop with this. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Shovini. Uh, your presentation was uh, quite uh, clear, and I'm sure that everyone could follow what you were trying to communicate. 
Um, and it was basically uh, exercise in uh, negotiating the uh, contradiction, as you see it, with uh, a kind of uh, concept of science and uh, on the one hand and the uh, social differences on the on the other and I'm sure that this would certainly add to the uh, overall studies on history of science uh, and and I'm sure that you know the kind of uh, data sources that you have tapped is also uh, quite uh, impressive in the sense that um, you went not only to the hospital records, but also uh, municipal records. And I'm sure that also you got some ideas, some information from the, from the voluntary agencies, which were also studied as you indicated. Now, um, I would invite, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know, are you, are you going to contact the question and answer session? Yes, I am. Yes. Uh, Rachel okay. isn't too well, so I'm going to okay. do it today. So, so I'll, I'll leave it to, leave it to Arunima. She would, uh, she would uh, handle the Thanks, question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, as I had announced earlier, thank you, Shogini. Thank you. That was really very interesting. Um, could we have people type in their questions into the chat box? Uh, the reason why we suggest that usually is that we get more questions and uh, it gives the speaker more time to respond to the questions. So, um, would I request uh, members of the audience who have questions to please type, uh, type their questions into the chat box? Um, there's a question from Pooja who says that it would have been good to see the statistical data that led to the conclusion stated. Uh, would you want to respond to that, Shuri? Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. No, I completely agree. I think I forgot to sort of drop that into the slide. But uh, if I can, uh, I don't think I can pull it up right now. Uh, but if I can just like sort of uh, give a brief um, uh, these are like the uh, material I use for mostly sort of the debates around uh, uh, what sort of data to use. And um, and in all these things, it's constantly said that, you know, we cannot really uh, use starvation as a category simply because uh, people are not trained enough to understand that. And uh, these you'll find in sort of like the Famine Commission reports. Um, and the statistical data, the statistical tables that eventually were put in the Famine Commission reports, which eventually were sent uh, also to the British uh, Parliament, include categorization of death only as uh, caused by cholera, fever, uh, smallpox, and so on. So you will not see uh, starvation as a category in those final reports. You'll see starvation as a category in small municipality reports, uh, particularly um, the quarterly public health reports but they are very sporadic. You'll find them once in a while. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Jinu Jeevi from uh, University College, he's a researcher there, says uh, whether the terminology tragedy of commons is associated with, with mortuary workers. Should I respond to that now? Yes, please. yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I haven't really come across uh, this uh, in the source materials I was looking at, uh, but thank you for letting me know. I'll keep in mind so that in case I do, I won't skip it. Uh, would Jinu Jeevi like to expand on that a little bit more to let us know why uh, there's an interest in this? Normally, it takes people a bit of time to warm up to asking questions. You see, that's what yeah. happens. And the online mode is a little alienating that way. It is. I mean, um, I am also that person who takes a while to write the questions. <laughs> uh, 
Givergi's aim asks, uh, during the 19th century plague in India and epidemic deaths in colonial India, were there mass deaths among the British people? How were these deaths and dead bodies managed? Yeah. Uh, I mean, of course, uh, if you go to sort of like, again, my experience has been mostly in Bombay and Calcutta. So you'll find a few graves in uh, Suri Christian Cemetery in Bombay, for example, or the um, a lower circular road cemetery in Calcutta, uh, where uh, sort of you'll see that it's written uh, that people uh, died of plague and also cholera it's it's sort of the same and these were mostly uh, again the usual practices of burials were followed with certain transformations like using chlorine before burials uh, that was a change that had happened and uh, there were also a new interventionist policy of the uh, I, of sort of um, what in bombay presidency was known as a uh, corpse infection in inspection which a lot of families did not allow but I don't know how much it actually, uh, the inspection were for uh, British people. I've not come across sources for that. Uh, so I'm assuming probably not. It was mostly in sort of like uh, the Jaws in Bombay, for example, that this was practiced more stringently ob with obvious um, uh, reasons being the uh, way the plague managed um, class distinctions, class differences in the city. So that's that. Uh, Dinu wants you to speak on David Arnold's views, but I'm not sure about what the first remark means. I'm doubtful about the endemic nowadays, pandemic, I guess, uh, but doubtful in what sense it's not clear to me, but perhaps it is to you. Show me. Um, I mean, I assume if, if you're uh, talking about uh, doubt in terms of sort of this bring, bringing about any massive social change, uh, I mean, I can't really say that uh, in the sense that that would be me speaking way out of my training and expertise. Um, but speaking on David Arnold's views, I must clarify that the uh, book that he's come up with um, isn't uh, out yet in India uh, in a paperback form, which I can afford. Uh, and I'm waiting for the library to get me any copy. But I've read the two articles which form uh, one of the chapters in the book which speaks about incinerators uh, for um, waste disposal versus incinerators for uh, human cadavers. And in that, David Arnold points out uh, something that I thought was very pertinent, uh, which is uh, that uh, there was a lack of um, trust on people who are actually going to use these machines. And the understanding was that uh, these machines should not be uh, uh, they cannot be managed by people who do not have sort of like the intellectual expertise of man managing big scientific uh, objects. So that was a running theme that David Arnold points out. Um, and uh, I think that that's a very uh, important point that he makes. Uh, at the same time, David Arnold's arguments in, uh, at least in that article, uh, it came out in 2018. It uh, tells us uh, about the uh, public health story of this, uh, about how these things, uh, incinerators and so on, trans, um, were made to uh, bring changes to uh, ideas of public health. I, In that article, at least, uh, he did not really clarify uh, much about uh, how scientific objects like cremation machines and so on built into it system of um, uh, through practice, uh, like through maintenance work and so on, like I had said, builds into it systems that are uh, speaking of the social differences of its time. For instance, uh, who are the ones who are maintaining? It's the blame, as I had pointed out, was constantly being put on mortuary workers, whereas it could have been a problem of supply of gas. Uh, so some small incidents like that, um, which uh, basically tells us about the fact that uh, uh, machines have, uh, how we use the machines are um, ways to understand uh, how social difference is built into these systems. Yeah. So 
So I think the question is what inspired you to start doing this work? Yeah, like I had said in sort of like the, uh, at the beginning, it was really like a few days of voluntary work for uh, teaching English that suddenly opened my eyes into something like this. Uh, and it's not like I started this project right at the beginning, right then. It was more like I just became familiar with the work and gradually warmed up to, to it till I realized that this is what I want to pursue. Tell us a little bit about these charity organizations that work with mortuary work. Yeah. That's really interesting. Uh, I had no idea there were uh, uh, charities of this kind. Oh, okay. Uh, so, um, I mean, uh, first of all, I mean, there are charities which are in like, which are particularly designated as charities. And then there are also a lot of, uh, you know, burial and burial uh, trusts, which also do charitable work with it. So the trust that I have looked at for Bombay, for example, is the Jama Masjid Trust and the um, Mahindarga Trust. Uh, because they have the burial grounds, they own uh, the trust properties, uh, the trust manages a lot of burials and so on. Um, then for Calcutta, it's two very specific mortuary charities that existed from uh, 1920s. One from 1905, the other from the 1920s. And um, in Calcutta and in Bombay, both of these uh, uh, work of charity that they do is predominantly related to uh, unclaimed bodies. And it also moves on to uh, thinking about charities for then those who have families but who cannot afford a full uh, burial or, a, or an expensive cremation and so on. Let us keep this in mind that in the 1920s and 30s, not everyone were using the incinerators, which uh, gradually was subsidized. And um, the use of uh, firewood was a little bit more expensive than burials. Uh, in many cases. And also um, a lot of people actually also used uh, burial charities because uh, like, for example, the trusts in Bombay, which has a separate history altogether because um, they allowed burials for everyone. So I'll give you one small example that really made me very interested in these charities. Uh, so uh, I think this is a statement that uh, a formal, former police commissioner of Bombay made in 1902 or 1903, speaking of deaths of sex workers in those times. And uh, they say that uh, we really don't know the religion of the prostitutes because at the moment of death, they might say they are Muslims because that will give them a decent burial, a decent chance to death. So charities also existed to, um, create certain aspirations for equality and certain aspirations for respectability, which, uh, uh, which I think is one of the reasons why they became so popular and why they still exist and why they, why they still hold such esteemed and important place in the local communities that they inhabit, but also in the larger city. And do we know anything more about the histories of how these charities were formed? Uh, yeah. With the people, why did they start thinking about mortuary work? And you know, um, so uh, there are annual reports for really them. One thing. Uh, yeah, I started getting into this because of the charity, as I said, because uh, because of the place I was uh, hanging out for a while. Um, and uh, okay, sorry, this all question. Yeah. Um, so the. Um, for example, the charity uh, that uh, was established in 1905 uh, in Calcutta, the uh, Mufid al-Islam, uh, they had, uh, it was initially founded by a merchant who had come from Gujarat, Ibrahim Dupli, who had settled down in Calcutta for like about 10 years. And then they had a lot of uh, networks with various parts of India from where they would get a lot of funds. And these were also, of course, uh, religious charity and therefore a lot of uh, uh, funds coming from the local community. Um, at the same time, uh, gradually from like, you know, the shift starts around 1920s and 30s that a lot of people who were from Krishak Praja party and then eventually the Muslim League, they become the secretaries and the presidents of these charities. And it becomes all the more interesting when it's a moment of famines and riots because these charities, keep in mind, are also providing 
independent numbers of people who are dying, community-based numbers of people who are dying in famines and riots. So they hold a very unique position in the history of the city, um, which uh, we really need to mine a lot more to think about uh, how the how death work actually also defines how we perceive the city to some extent. The charity which I saw from 1920s is so-called Hindu Satkar charity, which still these are charities that still exist. Um, and uh, that one charity came up at a time when the provincial government was gradually uh, going to this after the uh, final um, uh, election in the 40s, the provincial government is under the Muslim League. The municipality is uh, under gradually like uh, becoming under the Sabha. So it is at this point of time that there were a lot of small instances, a lot of like uh, uh, various forms of charities, not just mortuary charities, where uh, uh, a lot of uh, Hindu revivalists are, and Hindu nationalists are trying to get in and sort of do these uh, purificatory work. Um, which is what they call, they, they call it purificatory work in the sense that replacing uh, certain caste labor with uh, the purificatory work of a Brahmin, as, a, as one of the quotes had said, is a very like apparent system. Uh, the interesting point in one of those sources was that from 1940s onwards, like mid 40s, there is one report which says that we understand that um, we cannot uh, have domes perform work of uh, uh, all the work of ritual because they come from untouchability. But at the same time, I don't think it's prudent to write about these things. The report actually points that out. And that is a very uh, an, a sort of a different layer of um, invisibilization really that occurs at that point. So yeah, these are sort of like the roles that the charities plays. And, Partly because these charities are obviously existing because these are big cities with migrants. Um, and it's not like the, cha the charity's roles come up prominently during pandemics and epidemics and so on, but they actually exist to do the work for the poor for the longest time. Mm -hmm. So it's the moments of mass death, which are visible to the middle class, to the more privileged people that we actually get to see their work. Like even now, if you look at reports, these charities names will come up, but they actually do the work throughout. So, mm -hmm. um, so I think that's one thing we need to keep in mind that moment of mass death does not necessarily mean moments of public health crisis. Mass mm -hmm. death exists throughout. It's these moments that spike it into archives. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Jinu wants to know whether 1898 Famine Commission was related to then Viceroy uh, Lord uh, Lytton? Uh, no, that was 1880s, eight, hmm. the 1880s, the previous commission. Uh, Lakshay Talwar asks, would you be able to elaborate slightly more on the economics of managing bodies, starting from healthcare institutions to transportation to mortuary? I'm embedded currently in anthropological frameworks to understand this theme and the insights from the government. The charities, the private funeral managers seem very different in the pandemic today. It would be useful to know how this was panning out historically as well as, as well to trace the changes in social dynamics. Okay, um, I'll give a very quick overview of um, how I saw I'll bring up maybe like sort of two examples, one during the bubonic plague epidemic, particularly like uh, for Bombay. And I'll bring up another for the famines and uh, riots in Calcutta, because I think these will give us like two very different ways of thinking about the economics of managing bodies. Uh, if, if that is, if your question is regarding uh, pandemics and so on. Um, uh, like in Bombay, for example, there were a lot of uh, interventions regarding, like I said earlier, about inspecting the bodies uh, to see whether these are uh, deaths due to plagues or not. This led to a lot of uh, cry a lot of uh, protests in the city as well, and even in Pune and so on, where uh, corpse inspection became a thing. Um, so starting from, let's say, uh, if someone who died of the plague in healthcare institutions, like 
you know, the Maratha Hospital, which was an important place in Bombay. Then they were being carried to uh, uh, on like carts at that point of time. And these were being carried by mortuary workers whose names are not really stated. Like, obviously, we don't get those things even now. And uh, the fact that it mentions that they were being transported by carts, preferably sometimes at night, tells us about sort of the uh, work and the working class population that's congealed around it. Um, then uh, not really transportation to mortuaries in this cases, but transportation to cremation grounds. With the plague, there were designation, designated cremation grounds as well. Um, if you go to sort of the context of famine in 1943 and 1944 in Bengal, I have been looking mostly at Calcutta Municipal Report and uh, riots in 1946. Um, then it's a different uh, uh, problem altogether because in question in ter terms of famines, you find the bodies in other places, right? You don't find them in hospitals as such. You find some who has been brought into the hospital, but and particularly during riots where you don't find bodies in hospitals like at all. You find them in ditches. You find them in the roadside. So the process and of managing and bringing those bodies become very different. It's at this point of time, these, uh, you know, bigger technologies like these lorries and all coming to be uh, coming to the picture. They play an important role. The police plays a much important role here as opposed to the bubonic plague epidemic. Um, mortuary charities, like I mentioned, play important role because they are commissioned by the municipalities and also the provincial government to work with them because the municipality doesn't have the capacity to um, suddenly deal with such a surge in number of deaths. So that, that's a new domain that comes in. In terms of the economics, uh, in the bare bones of terms, the money, let's say, um, uh, for both famines and the riots, and also, also in place, actually, there have been a lot of charities, financial, uh, financial support that was brought in. And in particular, when it comes to sort of like these um, excessive work like death work, which the colonial state would consider to be an unnecessary expenditure, they wouldn't really put in too much uh, financial uh, weight on these processes, but instead would rely largely on uh, charities and so on. So um, that's like one of the ways where the money started uh, coming in. So for instance, in one of the charities that I saw for uh, Calcutta, uh, the football association and the hockey association also paid money to them, for example. So this is how it worked out. Or like money from the Birlas and like all the cotton merchants uh, and the jute merchants in Bengal. Yeah. Um, from Muzaffar to everyone, uh, it says uh, in Malabar, Kerala, when a colonial soldier or policeman is dying, there was a manual saying uh, about burial that manual says how to bury a christian jew or hindu but no reference how to bury a muslim is this the same in bengal and bombay uh this is interesting because um i haven't come across manuals which do not mention uh how to bury a muslim because uh possibly I, I don't know why it wasn't mentioned in uh, in the Malabar, but I have come across uh, instead like uh, burials. I mean, in the case of uh, Calcutta, uh, there was actually like burials of Jews were also mentioned because there was a particularly Jewish charity uh, uh, assisting as well. Um, but no, I've not come across the lack of reference. Uh, most of these references on Sort of these how-to manuals in municipal records are usually the bylaws. Um, the bylaws mention what are the right ways to do it, and they are very cursorily done. Uh, it doesn't really mention whether it's a Christian or a Muslim burial, but it will categorically mention that uh, they have to be uh, buried according to the uh, customs of the person, and that is how one has to sort of like you know figure out. In terms of colonial soldiers. Um, I, I actually don't know about this. It's something I'll definitely look up. Uh, but I know that in 1908 uh, or something, colonial soldiers, it, irrespective of whether they, they were Indians, like whether they were natives or they were uh, Europeans, uh, 
the um, military uh, department actually banned hospitals from dissecting bodies of soldiers irrespective of their uh, or, uh, of their nationality uh, for education purposes so the dissection could only happen if it was for medical legal purposes but those things could not happen in under display of other people as a form of education in medical colleges but again religion isn't uh, categorized in that as well uh, okay i'll definitely okay. check that out thank you so much i know that uh, yeah. uh, I, I, I don't know can, can i can i interview uh, yes uh, yeah, I, I just want to ask you two clarificatory questions, more, more or less in the same vein as it has been being discussed right now. Um, because, you know, when you read about the early trade union or workers association movements, particularly in, the, in, the, in, the, in England, uh, one of the common expenses for which they raise funds is for funeral services. Um, I was wondering whether, at least in the 1930s or 40s, uh, in Calcutta and uh, Bombay, have you come across um, trade unions? Um, uh, th they've already come up. I mean, trade unions, uh, do they intervene in the funeral services or do they make an impact, uh, at least noticeable impact, in the uh, whole picture of uh, at least the funeral service? Then I've got another uh, point uh, to be uh, clarified. What about the Parsis? You said about Jews having Parsis have an entirely different type of uh, after death kind of uh, uh, you take it to the Tower of Silence. And that would require uh, entirely different approach to the to the whole practice of how you uh, uh, handle the uh, bodies after death. I, I, I mean, I just wanted to know whether you have come across any information on this. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, these two questions, because, uh, yeah, I mean, when it comes to common expenses for funerals, and stuff, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, when it comes to common expenses, I did come across uh, uh, informal uh, um, sort of uh, uh, discussions around having funds for those who uh, died due to accidents, uh, especially in, in dock, amongst dock workers in both the cities and amongst, uh, 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 and you can also find a little in sort of like the factory commission reports where these were recommended by uh, where, where the factories or factory owners are supposed to do that. I haven't seen implementations. But in uh, papers on um, discussions on um, trade unions and uh, sort of like uh, in, on, for example, in cases of Calcutta, looking at sort of, you know, books and so on, which talk about early work on around trade unionism, we do get uh, sort of some sort of compensation uh, for the family of those who've uh, lost uh, their uh, family members due to accidents, particularly like specifically due to accidents. And in that, uh, we it also implies like there'll be a small fund for the burial or the cremation. So yeah, definitely it comes up as a thing. In fact, I think also Raj Chandavarkar's book on uh, Bombay has one passing sentence on this as well. Um, although doesn't really elaborate much on it. But one does come, and the early CPI documents of, from the 1950s. Uh, we'll get a little bit on that. Um, then about the Parsis, uh, common, yes, I mean when it comes to Bombay, obviously I got like so much of material on that. Um, I uh, my materials on these were mostly again from uh, the uh, provincial archive and the municipal archive. Uh, particularly when I was talking about the story of incinerators, in fact, the a group of people who moved for an incinerator for uh, the city of Bombay were actually uh, people uh, who wanted to bring 
uh, the technology uh, during the plague, but who were also Parsis. They wanted it to be also implemented in their own community and culture. And one of the reasons why it got uh, pulled down as a possibility was because others from the community protested against it. It's only then that the idea shifted that, okay, we can use an incinerator for, uh, like to coat for bodies of low caste, uh, coat, unquote, and or, and or unclaimed bodies. It's only when the experiment of possibilities on Parsis failed that it was shifted to experimentation of a technology on others. Uh, that also like there were like quite a lot of protests on that and that uh, failed. And at the same time, when they looked at the cost of importing and at this point of time, the uh, incinerator, the, the, yeah, the main, main machine, the incinerator itself had to be imported from either France or Germany. Siemens was one of the main companies and Toulouse, another in Toulouse was the other. It became a complicated situation because it was just too expensive and the returns weren't profitable enough. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Do we have any other questions? Also, I just wanted to add, uh, because I forgot to say this in the beginning, that if anybody wants their names to be added to our mailing list, please put in your email address into the chat box, we'll add you. Um, anyone else? If all questions have been uh, asked, can I ask you a question? not with regard to your presentation. I, I find that you are sitting in front of a, a beautiful painting. Would you, <laughs> would you comment on that? I have, so I'm at a friend's place because my internet isn't working. Okay. <laughs> so oh, I that's a, that's a, a friend's place. You can see it. <laughs> I'll ask her what's the situation here. <laughs> okay. But it really uh, is quite, in depth and like very detailed. Yeah, it's, it's, but it's, it's a print, it's not a painting. It's a no, it looks three dimensional uh, yeah. from here. I mean, like, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, don't, don't misunderstand that I was appreciating that and not listening to you. <laughs> there is another question from Vagesh Lal. Uh, so I have to sadly take everybody away from the happy area of painting back to mortuary work. Uh, Vagesh Lal's questions. I, along with a few of my friends from the uh, Department of Sociology uh, D School, uh, am part of a group researching the management of death during COVID-19, particularly the second wave in India. The caste distinctions are not as starkly visible in urban India today as they would have been in colonial India. How do we look more critically at this dimension of management of death? For example, what comes first to my mind is the conception of frontline workers as including doctors, nurses, even service providers like delivery drivers, etc. But not so many workers involved in the handling of dead bodies, which was an everyday reality because of the association of any and all labor involved in death uh, still carries a taboo. Right. Okay. And um I mean, I would love to talk to you about your work because it sounds um, like very crucial to our current predicament. And thank you for doing all this. Um, I, I mean, you know, it's going to be way out of my training as a historian to think about uh, what can be the ways to understand um, elements uh, such as these in present terms. Um, I don't think I'll be the right person to uh, respond to that. Um, uh, there'll be, uh, you could talk to ethnographers and anthropologists about it and from your profession as well, particularly, right? Um, but uh, I can say how I have been reading this from colonial sources, uh, which may help in some capacity, I'm not sure. Um, particularly, um, the way to, uh, for me, it's uh, the easiest way to think about uh, caste is not to think about only those who um, are stigmatized, but the way to think about caste is to think about it as the politics of high, uh, politics of power. 
So when I want to think about uh, caste in death work, I have to think about it as uh, how, like I said in the beginning of the presentation, how we have to think about the millennial practices of caste with the more modern histories of colonialism together as two as enmeshed um, uh, forms of knowledge, uh, which then systematically build around everything that we know and everything that we work around. So the moment you think about this as a form of power, you will, like we all will, right? We'll end up seeing our own, own complicity in it, our own role in it. And that's the, I suppose, the only way to think about this um, critically. So for instance, one um, interesting thing would be whenever I would look at the municipality uh, document, like annual reports and so on, like my surname is Chattopadhyay and I would see zillions of Chattopadhyays over there. They, um, because, you know, it's coming from a privileged caste background that has traditionally taken up uh, works of high office. So that's also caste-based work, right? And that is also creating the caste-based work of power and hierarchy. So once I started reading it in those forms of complicity, that uh, then it becomes, um, hopefully it will become easier to read every other as well. Yeah. I wondered if you had read uh, Aniket Zaure's work, uh, Practicing Caste. Um, I did. Yes, yeah, that would be I, 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 I loved how it began with the most simple of statements uh, in terms of touch. Mm -hmm. so. Do we have any other questions? I mean, uh, as a follow up to what uh, Vagesh Lal was asking you, I mean, the thought that struck me, and I think partly because there was a lot of uh, uh, not authenticated, but generally a discussion around this question about, you know, the bodies that were uh, buried in on the banks of the Ganga and that came floating up. There was some discussion about the fact that these probably were Dalit bodies, and you know that uh, you know that there were no spaces left in the cremation grounds, and you know complicated sort of uh, caste and death politics around that. But as you're saying quite rightly, I mean, unless and until a lot of this is actually studied more minutely and closely, uh, we still remain in the domain of perhaps pretty, uh, you know, the, the, it's still speculative, perhaps in the right direction, but unless and until we have more, you know, uh, fine-tuned research about this, we, it's, it's a little difficult to shoot one's mouth off. It remains very conversational. Uh, uh, Muzaffar, it is practicing caste on touching and not touching by Aniket Zaure. And anybody who is interested in the politics of caste or touch, or rather the aesthetics and politics of caste and touch, should really read this book. Yeah, it's, it's such a fantastic book. I mean, it really yes. transformed a lot of my thoughts and uh, while I was reading it. I know. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and what you had just mentioned about uh, sort of, you know, how uh, one can possibly identify uh, those who die. It's like, you know, colonial sources will not clarify, but these are all like all sorts of like speculative histories where we get into the domain of speculation a little bit. And I think rightly so, because has to, right? Uh, how else do we really do that? And uh, this is where like, because um, I look so much uh, on unclaimed bodies, especially when I'm looking at dis dissection and so on. And a few, one or two examples that come out of it um, gives us a good sense of migration, taking us then to issues of sort of like tracing us back to, you know, the census histories of migration looking at uh, city-based census on migration, questions of begging and so on, categories that the colonial state so emphatically has documented. And 
something comes out of it. Uh, speculative, yes, but it gives us a little bit of the social work that we see. And do we have any sense of what's happening amongst the Sikh? Because, um, you know, one of the interesting things of the modern moment uh, is the way in which we see uh, a certain kind of uh, almost uh, ascetic volunteerism uh, by the Sikh community uh, in many different contexts. So I was wondering whether there was anything about uh, mortuary work and the Sikh and how that worked out. Um, I don't know too much about this, but you're right. In 1944, for example, there was a voluntary organization for mortuary work and other forms of, and also relief work for food and so on for uh, for the Bengal famine in Calcutta. Uh, they eventually uh, collaborated, a few of them eventually collaborated with the Red Cross uh, in the city. And then information drops off. Uh, I got this from the Famine Commission report. Um, so there is, you're, you're right though, there's like this little bit of information. I don't know much about it. Uh, what was the larger realm and understanding? I'm assuming if one would uh, look at sort of, um, you know, the terrains of like Delhi or uh, sort of post partition um, transformations and so on, a lot of interesting thing in mm. this particular case would come up. Also because it's only now that people are beginning to speak about caste and the Sikh community and that it's yeah. and so on, you know, with all the data mm. and all of that. Yeah. It's an interesting issue around how mm. this gets factored in. So I just wonder, yeah. I know that's not the area you're studying. <laughs> no, but it's just like the present takes us back to some of the questions so much. Like Absolutely. I wouldn't have thought about the 1944 that one uh, group, uh, unless you ask this question. <laughs> I just remember reading. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions from anyone else? Anyone who finds it difficult to type but would rather ask? <laughs> would, since we've had many typed questions, could, if anyone else wishes to add a question. Otherwise, it's my pleasant task to thank Shohini for this rich and nuanced discussion on such an important aspect of our lives, really, and, and also our political landscape. So thank you so much, Shohini Chattopadhyay, for having come and shared your work. And we wish you all the best in your PhD work and um, waiting to hear the next stage of this once it's done and, you know, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me and also because if one looks at the who who of people who've spoken, I was like, wow, this is very Well, cool. I have read a piece of yours, you see, so I uh, was very, very interested in what your work was on. <laughs> so <laughs> I wanted to hear that. Yeah, yeah. it all came together very uh, oddly in the sense that, I mean, I didn't obviously start keeping the present moment in mind because that's unanticipated. But it has been an emotionally charged time to think about uh, this work. And at the same time, looking at one's own privilege and complicity in so many of the practices, hoping uh, I do a better job. No, you will, I'm sure. All the so, best. Thank, thank you. you. So much. Thank you very much, Sony. Thank you. For all, the, all the best in your work. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you for being here. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.